Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Earth Journalism Network webinar series, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Amy Sim, and I'm the project manager for Internews Earth Journalism Network Asia Pacific Project. The topic of today's webinar is COVID-19 and the environmental crisis, harnessing data to expose inequality and wildlife trafficking. As journalists all over the world are busy reporting on COVID-19 infection rates and fatalities, there is another important COVID-19 story to tell, which is not always getting enough public's attention, and that is that the COVID-19 pandemic is part of the many disasters and threats that are coming out of the environmental crisis that our world, our earth is facing. And they're like, and, and they're like climate change and other environmental problems, the most vulnerable communities are bearing the brunt of the consequences. One way to tell this story is by exploring existing data sets. And I'm very pleased today to be joined by three data journalists will share with us a range of data sources and ideas that journalists can draw from to do stories that can bring out the linkages between COVID-19, health impacts and the environmental crisis. Um, before I turn over to our speakers, I want to say a few words about the Earth Journalism Network in case some of you uh, may not be familiar with us. Earth Journalism Network is a project of Internews, which is an international media development organization Earth Journalism Network is a community of around 12,000 journalists from 180 countries who share the same passion for environmental reporting. At EJN, or Earth Journalism Network, we work closely with our community to improve the quantity and quality of environmental reporting. You can find out more about us on our website, earthjournalism.net, and if you like, just sign up as a member. It's free, and we often put out different opportunities for journalists like you. This webinar is one of a series of webinars that EJN is holding about COVID-19, its environmental origins and its impacts. If you'd like to let us know what topics you would like us to cover in our future webinars, you can write in the chat function here, or you can email us at info.ejn at internews.org. Um, you can see that in the, in the chat, um, we have our email address written there. So today's webinar will last around an hour or slightly more than an hour and consists of two main parts. For the first part, we will focus on investigating wildlife trafficking. Roxanne Joseph from the Oxpackers will introduce a new data journalism tool known as WildEye Asia, which provides data on illegal wildlife seizures, arrests, court cases and convictions across Asia to help journalists um, investigate wildlife crimes. Next, we will have uh, Bao Choi, an open data and investigative journalist from Hong Kong. She will demonstrate how she used co Chinese court records to produce a data-driven investigation into the illegal wildlife trade. And following their presentations, we'll have a 15 minutes question and answer session. Then we move on to the second part of the webinar. We will look at other COVID-19 related data story ideas beyond wildlife trafficking. Eva Concenteras, a data journalist specialist, a specialist uh, who has been building um, data journalism teams in many develop developing countries, will share with us several data sources that journalists can explore to explain how pollution, food production, and other forces combine to make COVID-19 so dangerous for vulnerable communities at the forefront of the environmental crisis. And after Eva's presentation, we will have time to do another round of Q&A. You can ask questions throughout this webinar, and we ask that you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please put down your name and the country you're from, along with your questions. We'll collect your questions and address them during the Q&A sessions. There's also a chat function, but I ask that you only use the Q&A uh, feature for sending questions. So without further ado, I will turn over to Roxanne to introduce herself and her work. Over to you, Roxanne. Thanks, Amy. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever in the world you're based. I hope that you're staying safe and sane in these crazy times. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Roxanne. And I work with Oxpec as investigative environmental journalism on the Wild Eye series. Today, I'm going to be introducing you to our latest edition, which is Wild Eye Asia, 
a tool that maps and tracks illegal wildlife trafficking across the continent. Before I tell you a little bit more about the tool, I just want to give a brief introduction to Oxpeckers. So Oxpeckers is Africa's first journalistic investigative unit that focuses exclusively on environmental issues. And it does this by combining traditional investigative reporting with data analysis and geomapping tools in order to track and expose criminals in Africa, Asia, Europe. It's kind of expanded to all over the globe. Um, Oxpec is, is, or has rather for the past few years, been developing the most comprehensive database of eco-offenses in Africa. And the wild eye tools are just one aspect of this. I encourage you to go and look at the many other tools available on their website. And of course, um, we work with media partners to tell stories and make these tools and resources and data available to the public. Um, I am going to stay on my presentation, but if you'd like, um, here is the link to Wild Eye Asia. Um, you'll see when you go onto the tool, this map and a pop up will appear. Um, the link is also in the chat, as far as I know. So, what is Wild Eye? Wild Eye is a resource a freely available resource that maps seizures, arrests, court cases, and convictions of illegal wildlife trafficking. We have two versions of the tool. The first in Europe, which was released about a year ago, and as of today, officially, now Asia. WildEye was a tool that was developed by journalists for journalists, but this doesn't mean that only journalists can use it. Um, it's also aimed at researchers, conservationists, environmentalists, anyone who might be interested in wildlife trafficking. What we've done is created our own data set by collecting the data from a range of different sources and translated this into a platform that makes this information truly accessible. Like I've said, it's easy to find, it's easy to use, and it's completely free for anyone to access. WildEye is an interactive tool that gives you, the user, complete control. Um, and when I talk about exactly what the tool does, I'll explain this a bit further, but it allows for a personalized access to the data so that you can get the information that is relevant to you specifically. WildEye can be used for analysis, research, and storytelling, among other things. Um, and I suppose just to say, WildEye was developed by Oxpeckers in partnership with Earth Journalism Network. So why WildEye and why now? How are we supposed to know what law enforcement agencies and legal systems in Asia are doing about illegal wildlife trafficking across the globe? In the post COVID-19 era, this question is not only a concern for environmentalists who are focused on saving endangered species, it's unfortunately become relevant to everyone. And until now, there has been no single place to access this information easily on efforts to crack down on wildlife crime. So WildEye aims to address this gap by tracking and sharing data on justice in action. What does WildEye actually do? Like I've said, there are currently two different versions of the tool, and we hope to expand this to other parts of the world. But I think it's important to say that um, all of these different tools and data sets are, of course, linked, because as many of you know, the trade goes across the globe. Um, so when you go onto WildEye, you'll see a map. And these maps are populated with little icons that contain information about a seizure, an arrest, a court case, or a conviction. This is information such as a suspect's name, um, the date and place of arrest or the seizure, the relevant authorities involved, as well as the specific details of the incident. Now, like I said earlier on, you can filter your experience to get the information that you specifically want. You can do this either by in the top right hand corner, when you go onto the map initially, 
all of the points displayed are from all four of the categories. So that's seizures, arrests, court cases, and convictions. But those little buttons in the top right-hand corner are um, clickable, sorry. And you can filter your experience like that. So you can only see arrests if you'd like, you can only see convictions if you'd like, and there are different colors, which you can see on the key underneath the map. Or you can use in the top left-hand corner, there's a search function and you can search for a suspect's name, a place, or a specific keyword such as pangolin, scale, ivory, etc. Now, the, this um, isn't available yet, but will be soon. We're about to implement an alert system on both of our tools, which is very exciting. Um, and this allows the user to stay up to date. So, if you would like to subscribe to a specific case or perhaps a specific area, those are the, the different options, then you can click on the map. It'll all be available there. There'll be a button to subscribe. Um, and you just put in your email address. It doesn't, um, it won't send you any spam or anything other than the specific updates that you want. So there'll be no need to manually search for updates. Instead, you can rely on WildEye to do this for you. So how can journalists use the tool? Journalists can use WildEye to track data, patterns, or trends for use in their investigations. And just a couple of examples of stories that have been done in the past. Um, what are law enforcement efforts, sorry, where are law enforcement efforts concentrated if maybe there are a lot or very few data points in a specific area? And are these leading to judicial certainty? So are arrests and seizures actually leading to prosecutions and even better convictions? Um, is there more intense control in some parts or do smugglers simply have a preference for different routes? And a big one <laughs> that we've kind of found across the board, unfortunately, why do so few seizures and I suppose arrests result in prosecutions and even more so in convictions? So are the um, arrests and seizures actually leading to a tangible outcome? You can also use WildEye to identify cases to build brand new stories. There are so many untold stories um, and resources that haven't yet been tapped into across the continent. And I think, it, you know, it's, it's again, it's worth mentioning, um, like Amy said, the world has its eye on wildlife trafficking right now. And we encourage you as journalists, as storytellers, to use your voice to tell important stories using information like this and hopefully affect change. WildEye is first and foremost a community-based platform and there are four different ways in which you can be involved. The first is by accessing the data. So like we've already explained, Oxpec is a, a data-driven organization um, and all of the information that is published in our stories and on our tools is freely accessible to anyone who wants to use it. So on oxpeckers.org in the top right hand corner, you'll see a tab called get the data. You can go there and you'll find specific data sets, but you can also ask us for specific parts of the wild eye data sets if you prefer. And we can give you the raw data in a CSV or an Excel file, for example. You can also pitch a story, of course. WildEye wants to tell hard-hitting stories about illegal wildlife trade. And again, we encourage you to tell stories that are important to the people and communities around you and stories that, aren't, that haven't yet been told or focused on by um, the mainstream media. So you can suggest a story by, on the map, in the left-hand corner, there's a little drop-down menu and if you go to the reach out tab, then you'll find a handy little Google form and it asks for very, very basic information like your name, your organization and for a description of your story. So WildEye isn't also, sorry, isn't only a resource that gives data. Um, we also ask for data and this is a big um, part of it being a community built platform or community focused platform rather. We're always looking to add new data to WildEye. You know, as many of you will know, it's really difficult to get data from all different parts of the world. 
Um, so if you have a data set you'd like to share, you can go to exactly the same place, reach out on the map, and again, you'll fill in the form asking for very basic information. Um, the final way is to share this resource, share it on social media, share it with your networks. Um, if you'd like to include wild eye data in your story, just let us know. Um, and we may be able to even feature your story on the wild eye platform. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand over to Bao Choi, an investigative journalist um, based in China, who did a story, the lead story, actually, um, based on wild eye data. And yeah, I'm going to hand over to you, Bao. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you, Rosane, for the introduction. And also, um, thanks for having me here today to share some of my experiences in um, doing our investigation with uh, Auspeckers. Um, so here is the story that we published yesterday. Um, it is a very straightforward uh, story, actually. We um, collect uh, an extract data from the Chinese verdicts uh, since last December to mid-April um, on pangolin-related crimes. And after analyzing the data, we find out that uh, the Chinese court are uh, making very lenient punishments to um, pangolin-related criminals. And this article go further to explain uh, why would this happen and what are the views of environmentalists as well as uh, legal experts. Um, so you can see from this um, data visualization graphics, um, which indicates that actually my, um, half of the offenders related to pangolin crimes were just giving a suspended sentence less than a year, which means they did not really have to go into prison and just um, what did they have to do is just pay the penalty or fines to the authority and that's it. Um, so um, the article tried to explain the reasons behind, um, the rationale behind, and also it further discussed about the potential legislative reform, um, especially after um, the outbreak of COVID-19. So um, the tools we use um, for this investigative story is the China Judgments Online. Um, it's a one-stop over official um, government database which upload many of the verdicts from the Chinese courts. Sadly, it's not in English version, so you really have to find someone who reads Chinese um, to use this uh, database. Um, it did not upload all of the verdicts in the Chinese society, um, but I would say it provides a basic and comprehensive database for you to um, have a look into the crimes that you are interested. And somehow you have to combine this database with some other sources like news report um, or other government official websites or other court websites to make your investigation more comprehensive. Um, as it is in Chinese, so I would just uh, simply go through the template of the website. Um, just like here, I try to type the word pangolins and then uh, this website will sort all of the verdicts um, here. It's about one, more than 1,000 verdicts. And then you can sit, uh, set all the filters to um, filter the information that you would like to have, like the time, the places, the level of courts and the nature of the crimes. Um, after uh, collecting the verdicts related to our target, what we'll have to do is to massage the data in a more organized way um, so that we can really look into the story angle. Um, in this cases, and among many of the verdicts, we will have the names of defendants, the dates of arrest, um, the dates of sentencing, uh, where would the crime happens, what happened with the crimes or the criminals, what are the sentencing. And in this story, we uh, find out that um, the main observation of uh, after analyzing the data is the lenient punishments given by the Chinese courts. And so that we made um, made this story angle. And to me, the most difficult part is that um, you can see from the database that you can obviously has many data or information from this website. So in this story, the most difficult part is to narrow down the scope that we are interested at. Um, at the very first beginning, we focus, uh, we discuss about uh, the idea of um, 
analyzing the data about wildlife trafficking animals in China. But of course, this topic is too big. Um, and so and um, we try to narrow the focus to pangolins, which is an interesting animal as it is the most trafficked one in the world. And also um, it become more, uh, it's drawing more attention after pangolins, um, which have studies um, showing that it could be the intermediate host of the uh, coronavirus. So I, we think we, it would be very interesting and timely to um, go into the details of pangolins. And so um, here's our story. Um, I think it's time to have the QA so that uh, we will be very interested to share some of our views or experiences. And I would just pass the time to Amy to you. Thank you, Bao. Yes. Thank you very much, Bao. Um, thank you, Bao and Ro Roxanne. Um, so uh, if you have questions for Bao and Roxanne, please send in on the Q&A. Uh, Bao unfortunately can't stay with us for the whole of this webinar. She has a reporting assignment, so uh, she'll be here with us for the next uh, maybe 10 minutes or so to answer some questions and then she will have to leave. Um, so if you have any questions for Bao, please send it on uh, first. Um, Roxanne, a few questions on Wild Eye. There's one um, from Damien um, asking Will there be a feature of wild eye that will show if the data was ob obtained or an arrest made from evidence for online trafficking? So sorry, I was actually about to type an answer, but perhaps it's better to, to just answer like this. So hi, Damien. Thanks for your question. Um, we really appreciate it. So we include data on all different types of incidents including online trafficking. And we do follow very closely on um, social media and organizations who track this kind of information specifically. And online trafficking is actually one of our major interests. So we do try and, I mean, we focus on everything. Our focus is very broad, but we do try and include um, this type of information on, on Wild Eyes. So, I'm just trying to think. I, I don't think that there are currently that many incidents on online trafficking on Wild Eye Asia. There are actually quite a few on our other Wild Eye. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, I hope that answers your question. We do, there won't be a specific feature. Um, so it won't be a category per se because we've chosen to categorize it um, according more to the uh, judicial outcomes and efforts and um, yeah, descriptions. Uh, but we do always explicitly state in the description of an incident if it's related to, to some kind of online enabled trafficking. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Roxanne. And another question on how can you be sure of the data's reliability? Mm -hmm. Um, so we include the source on in the raw data um, and we always basically what we do is we look at media reports um, on social media like I said organizations you know there are tons of organizations collecting this kind of information um, and we'll always check to see if it's reported on on more than one platform um, so we don't have a specific number of uh, places that we look, but we do um, we do include that information on uh, within the the raw data. Um, yeah, and it, you know if we're really unsure about an incident, then we won't include it until we've been able to verify it. So we have data wranglers and we work with journalists who are based in Asia. And sometimes what they will do is they'll contact the authorities directly and ask them for confirmation or verification on a case. But the short answer is that we check to see if it has been um, reported on in multiple places by um, reliable sources. Thank you. There's a question from Stanley um, on whether the tool um, will make it available, the circumstances of arrest and the court proceedings, because um, Stanley thinks it's important um, mm. also to learn about the technicalities around the cases. Um, that's a very good question and something that has, that has been brought up um, in the past couple of years that we've been doing this kind of work. 
at the moment, um, not yet, just because collecting this kind of information is so incredibly difficult. Um, and our approach right now is to put out as much as possible, as much verified information as possible. Um, and if, if, you know, in media reports, or if we can ideally get court records. So for example, um, what Bao did was she went to a specific um, portal and some of her incidents include descriptions or not technicalities, um, but I suppose some details about uh, the circumstances of arrest. Um, you know, just in terms of court proceedings, I think, you know, I, I'm not sure if um, if my, my colleague Fiona from Oxpeckers would uh, like to jump in, but I'll just say that we are not legal experts. Um, so to try and, you know, explain and go into great detail about court proceedings specifically, that's not what we do. But again, we do include all of the links um, and the sources of where we find this information. So that's definitely something to consider and something, thank you so much, Stanley, we'll, we'll make a note of that and maybe somewhere down the line when we have a little bit more manpower um, and perhaps someone who is well-versed in the, the um, legal system. I mean, the other thing is that we are collecting information from about 13 or 14, if not more, different countries and the legal system is different in all of those. So we'd have to find a way of um, standardizing that. Thank you. So uh, I think Stanley asked a follow-up questions, which I thought I would just ask here as well um, about promoting um, issues on wildlife trafficking in, in classrooms and whether students and teachers can also contribute to the data um, on wild, wild eye. Um, I think that would be fantastic. You know, as many people as possible, like you know like i said in in my presentation this is not just for journalists this is for anyone and so long as the data can be verified and so long as it has um at least some of the major details within it then that's definitely something that we can look at at adding to wild eye and i think you know it would be fantastic to be able to expand the the user base and the community of wild eye to teachers um, and to students you know to to younger people um, so yeah i think i think that would be fantastic and again so long as the data can be verified then it can be added to, to the map thanks there's a question from sam mcneil from ap in beijing um, he wants to know whether you work with um, Chinese environmental groups like the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Fund to track cases and local police raids. Um, he thinks there's a lot, a lot of data that, that they have um, um, that, that can uh, sort of help to enrich what Wall Eye is already collecting. Um, perhaps both um, Bao and um, Roxanne can answer this question. Sure, Bao. Yes, um, I think um, China Biodiversity, um, the uh, funding organization is definitely a good partner to cooperate with. Actually, one, my, one of my interviewees is the spoke, um, person, is one of the spokesperson of the organization, and they have a very thorough understanding on the current situation in uh, China, especially there's a lot of trafficking um, where the destination were exported to China. So I, I think it would be a very good idea for um, the YR Asia to have collaborations with um, local environmental groups so that you can have a lot of information and update information. Yeah. It would be a good yeah. idea. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and just to add that, you know, we do try and work with, like I said, journalists and data wranglers who are based in, in these countries in China, like Bao, for example, um, who you know, either have experience of working with these organizations, have contacts in these organizations, um, or perhaps interview them for their stories. So we do try and, and, and we have, you know, we have for a couple of years now been developing these types of networks. 
um, yes, there is obviously a lot more, there is of course a lot more data that isn't currently on Wild Eye, um, but that's only just because the tool has just been, this specific iteration of the tool has just been launched. Um, so it will take a bit of time to add that data and to build up these networks and to get information from, from other organizations. But I, I just want to say, if um, other people within this webinar do have suggestions like that of organizations to talk to, then please reach out to us um, and we'll definitely try our best to get in touch with them and get information from them. Um, Alok Gupta from CGTN Beijing wants to know that there was a, a, a big uh, seizure in, uh, in, in involving illegal pangolin skills um, that was seized in Hong Kong, Singapore, and China worth more than 100 million. Um, he wants to know whether well, I have related data to exactly what happened with those involved in smuggling the consignment. Um, I will have to double check that and if you could drop your email address in this chat that would be fantastic um, Alok thank you for for your question but um, I think I remember uh, reading about those incidents and if I've read about them then it's more than likely that that they are in wild I, I can't tell you off the top unfortunately I can't tell you off the top of my head um, what the details of, of that incident are but if they aren't on there um, then I will add them um, and I'll send those details to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, Alexi um, also asked, I think this is actually a question to Sam who asked that question about uh, working with Chinese uh, NGOs, whether mm. um, he knows of other, or he or anyone on, on, on this webinar know of other active uh, NGOs working on conservation in China uh, besides CBCG, China Biodiversity Conservation. Foundation. I have that question too because they come up very often. Mm. Uh, it's good to know what other active organizations there are. Um, and if any of you um, can share, uh, you, if you have this information, please, please share in the chat so everybody can see. Um, there's a question from Kahindi um, on whether or not uh, one can get data on Nigeria. Um, so there are a handful of incidents related to um, seizures that originated or arrests that originated in African countries. Um, I'm not sure if Nigeria is one of them, um, but how, how the wild eye um, maps work is we include incidents where a seizure or arrest or a court case or a conviction happened on that specific continent. So we won't have, ex um, data on cases and incidents that took place in Nigeria specifically. Um, it'll only be included on Wild Eye if the commodities uh, involved in the incident originated from Nigeria or passed through Nigeria. So we do include information about the route um, that a, a, an incident took place. Um, but like I said earlier on, we hope to expand the, the wild eye community to beyond simply Europe and Asia. And given that uh, we ourselves are based in Africa, that'll definitely be something that we, we hope to focus on in the future. Another question from Sam um, asking um, whether you see a drop in wildlife crimes uh, since mm -hmm. the outbreak in Wuhan. Um, yeah, he thinks it might be a bit too early to do an analysis, but he wants to just hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, we, this was one of the first things that we looked at um, when we decided to, to actually launch Wild Eye Now. Um, I, <laughs> I can't answer that. And perhaps, you know, um, I definitely like to, to get Bao's input on this, um, given that she is, she is based there. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really not sure. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, for sure, uh, I think it will take time to test whether there will be a decreasing wildlife trade um, in China, especially when the Chinese government is trying to uh, make their uh, penalties and sentencing. Um, they are trying to do some legislative reforms to ban all the eatings of wildlife animals. Um, and many provinces are just uh, right doing the legislative work. And so it will take time to look at the situation. 
Um, but uh, in, very interestingly, actually, just after the outbreak of COVID-19 at Wuhan, um, from news report and from an announcement from the uh, government's website, we can still um, see there are a lot of um, uh, crackdowns on illegal real life uh, trafficking. So uh, in our story, I also mentioned there has been two big pangolins uh, related crimes. Um, crackdowns uh, after in early April or in mid-March, which indicates that um, maybe traffickers, they are trying to sold out all their illegal products uh, when the enforcement become more and more tightened up. So I, I would say uh, we need to have more time to observe how would be the changes uh, in China. Yeah. And I think just to add, you know, something that we're very interested to see is what um, what happens in terms of justice, you know, uh, are sentences increased, um, are more people convicted and prosecuted for these types of crimes? That's definitely something, and, and you know, I agree that it's definitely too early to see now, but it's something that we will be following very closely um, on Wild Eye. Thank you for your question. On that note on conviction, there's a question from Krishna on uh, how can we improve conviction rates that, mm -hmm. um, it seems like the convi conviction uh, rate is, is very poor. Um, whether you have any thought about how we could um, improve that. Bob, how would you like to? Oh, it's, um, I, I think, um, of course, we have to um, do with the legislative reform. And I mean, education is always the most important thing that we can, I mean, to really stop those crimes because I do agree that if there is no demand, there will be no supply, I mean, in the wildlife trafficking world. Um, for the conversion part, I, I think it really depends on the legal system of um, different countries. Like Hong Kong is a very important middle point of trafficking, but uh, as a Hong Kong president, I, I, I do really feel, think the enforcement is not that, um, severe to um, stop those crimes and the sentencing is not that threatening. Um, there has been a lot of uh, NGOs and advocacy groups in Hong Kong trying to urge the courts to um, putting uh, to put more heavier sentences to those individuals or groups who or syndicates who who do the trafficking uh, crimes. Um, but I, I guess it's a very complicated issues because it's it's, it's a problem across the globe and across many continents, yeah. And just to add, you know, write stories about what's happening, share this information, you know, conduct analyses, do research, reach out to organizations doing this kind of work. And this is exactly um, the reason that Wild Eye and this, you know, we, we put this kind of data out there and we tell these kinds of stories. A lot of people, don't understand the severity of of these types of incidents and the the technicalities and complications of of these incidents and the crossover um, between different areas of trade. So, yeah. Um, one last question before we move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, Alexis is asking, uh, what are the chances you think China will take endangered wildlife out of their pharmacopoeia out of their, their, their pharmaceutical products? No, <laughs> uh, because um, it's very sad, but um, the latest legislative reform also exam are the uh, products from um, medical use. So which means that, um, I mean, pangolin scales, wild horns, um, and any other wildlife animals which claim to be have medical purposes, they can still, I mean, enter the market legally, which is a very bad thing to, to the whole earth, I would say. But I, I know that a lot of environmental groups and advocacy um, institutions are trying to pushing very hard to improve the current situation. But I, I would say that's a very, also, there's like uh, a lot of stakeholders in the society. They're like the wildlife breeding industry, which has a very um, uh, big power in the legalization process. And so I, I think the Chinese government is trying to balance this different kind of interests um, to, to, to make the legislative reform be acceptable to all the parties. 
um, I think we have to work hard to push for this in the future. Yeah, just, just, just don't stop writing our story and just don't stop our advocacy work. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pao, um, and thank you for joining us today. I know you have to go for your reporting assignment. Um, we still have Eva, who's going to come up next. Um, but before I go to Eva, I just want to say that um, that question just now about other active um, NGOs working on conservation in China. Uh, Alok Gupta also shared um, that Friends for Animals, based in Beijing, they have uh, a good, they are a good resource on legal aspects of wildlife trade in China, as well as uh, Beijing Normal University, especially professor, professor Zhong Li from Beijing Normal University. University. Thank you a lot for sharing these resources. So we'll move on to Eva for the second part of um, our webinar today and she will share with us other uh, data sources and uh, data journalism ideas uh, besides wildlife trafficking ever. Over to you. Thank you Amy um, and thank you to Earth Journalism Network for organizing this panel. Um, I'm really happy to go after Roxana and bow because I think they really set the bar for how you can do really fantastic uh, data stories um, about COVID-19 and climate change based on data. And what I wanted to share a little bit is how do you, how do you get started in this kind of story? So how can we start to do data stories around climate change, around COVID-19, basically, basically from the beginning? So what I'm gonna take you through um, is basically an approach that you, I hope all of you can adapt. And what I hope that in the next 20 minutes is by the end of this webinar that you all have a very concrete idea of a data story that you could do about COVID-19 and climate change. Um, I'm going to be talking about several different resources, uh, but I am, Primarily, my primary job is to be the data journalism advisor for internews. So if you're looking for resources, um, and I think we're gonna drop this in the chat as well. Uh, the website is datajournalism.internews.org and there you can find lots of different resources. Um, I've started data teams in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Kenya and Myanmar and lots of different places. Um, so you can see a lot of the materials that I've provided to journalists there. Um, but one thing that Bao and Roxana touched on that I think is really important is that basically every good data story starts with a good question, right? So Bao basically started with the question of what, what is the sentencing for people who are actually convicted of wildlife trafficking? That's a very specific, very concrete question that she tried to answer with data. Uh, Roxanne suggested questions like where, where are people being, where, what governments are doing the best job of convicting people of wildlife crimes. Um, so I think my first tip is what's your question? Um, yesterday, the 2020 Pulitzer Prize winners were announced. Um, the prize for the best explanatory reporting was won by the Washington Post for an environmental story. So they did a story called Two Degrees Beyond the Limit. And I really like this story because the question that they asked is so basic. The question that they basically asked ha is, how has life changed in parts of the country already experiencing ex extreme climate change? Okay, so basically what they did in this story <laughs> was they looked at temperature data they looked at weather data um, and they figured out that there's several US towns and cities where the average temperature is already above two degrees. It's already warmed more than two degrees. And that's, bas that's basically all the data they use. They said, let's look at temperature data. Let's look to see where in the country it's gotten really hot. And then let's go to those towns. Let's go to those cities and let's see what's happening. So, they found things like ice is melting faster. They found things like mosquitoes are getting worse. They found things like lobsters are dying. Um, they found things like people are getting sicker um, as, as the environment changes. They found that plants are dying. Um, so I think if that story can win the Pulitzer Prize, 
for such a simple use of data, I think it really speaks to citizens wanting more and better information about climate change. People finally want to have an explanation about how is climate change contributing to wildlife trafficking? How is climate change contributing to COVID-19? How is climate change contributing to food insecurity? So basically what I'd like to do is I want just to walk you through what this process looks like. So I want you to think about how you can tell a data story and I'm just gonna take an example. So if you have climate data um, and you have health data, how can we put, put together a story through that? So the background image here is, is about pollution. Um, pollution is one of the big issues that we're seeing now because of the COVID-19 lockdown, pollution rates have decreased. So the first thing that I usually do um, when I work with a group of journalists on data stories is we map out all the different possible factors um, that are contributing. And from there, we're gonna pull out our question. So you can see with a topic like health and climate change, there's a lot of, lot of different questions we could ask, right? We could ask questions about exposure. We can ask questions about things like air quality and water quality. Um, we can look at things like what, how has climate change already made people more vulnerable? Um, what health conditions have, have made things worse? Where is the health system, healthcare system already overstretched? And then finally, okay, so now if we know these factors, how can we link it to COVID-19? So if we know where the air quality was already bad to begin with, if we know that people already have lung disease, can we figure out if there's more people dying of COVID-19 in those areas? Do we know if people who are vulnerable in those areas are getting tested? Um, and I think, as you can see, there's many, many different questions uh, that you can answer with data. And I think a lot of journalists get lost because they don't, they don't focus on simply one question. So to walk you through an example, I want to ask a very simple question. So what are the biggest climate change related killers in my community? So we know there's a lot of attention on COVID-19 right now. Um, this is a very, very good opportunity to talk about how climate change is already making people sick uh, in your community. So you could things that look at things like, what's the impact of natural disasters on people's health? What is the impact of mosquitoes? How has climate change changed access to clean water? And how has climate change changed uh, air quality and made people sicker? Um, so from all of those, I just, I'm choosing one question. And I wanna know what is killing people um, in my community for diseases that can be traced back uh, to climate change? Okay, so this in three simple steps is basically how I've trained journalists um, to do their data stories. So we have our question. Now we're gonna go through where to find the data and then finally we're gonna tell our story. Okay, so my question, where do I find data on causes of death by mosquitoes and climate change? Many of you have probably heard of the Institute of Health Metrics uh, because they're the ones doing all the COVID-19 projections. So this is the University of Washington that does a lot of the estimations. They have lots of really great data that's not about COVID-19. Um, they have lots of country specific, demographic specific health data. So you can figure out how many children are being killed by dengue in your country over the last 30 years. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? <clears throat> the World Health Organization has similar data. Um, the Global Neglected Tropical Disease Database has very, very specific data, especially for Asia, um, about how climate change is affecting um, different disease and mortality rates. Um, specifically talking about mosquitoes, um, Nature has put together a database on the spread of mosquitoes and the diseases that they're carrying. And then finally, kind of like what Roxanne said with um, wild eye, we always try to find multiple sources of data. So also looking at national level data um, that are collecting 
data on who's being killed by uh, diseases related to mosquitoes and climate change. Okay, so once we have our data, that's when we're starting to look for our stories, right? So I looked for some data stories um, being told right now in the middle of COVID-19. And again, diseases that should be covered right now are being neglected because of all the COVID-19 coverage. So dengue in Malaysia is going up. Um, cholera, a disease that's actually going to be treated fairly similar to COVID-19, um, has been forgotten in a lot of places. Malaria is anticipated to get much worse. And all of these diseases are, are getting worse uh, because of climate change and because a lot of the funding that they would be getting otherwise is being redirected uh, to fighting COVID-19. So even with a simple question like what mosquito-borne diseases are killing people in my community, you can see um, that you can come up with quite a lot of uh, data story angles. Okay, so what about COVID-19? How can we turn this into a COVID-19 story? Once you begin collecting data on your communities and understanding the health issues affected, affecting your community, you'll have a lot of data to overlay um, when you do your stories. So going back to the Washington Post here. The Washington Post has pivoted right now um, from looking at climate change to looking at COVID-19. As you can see here, they have overlaid in this map on the left, the darker the blue, the more positive COVID-19 cases there are, right? So you can see these dark blue areas um, have lots of COVID-19. And finally, the yellow boxes indicate where the majority of the population is African American. One of the big reasons that they figured out um, that African Americans are more likely um, to die from COVID-19 is because they were already sick to begin with because of climate change. Uh, so they live in areas with high levels of air pollution. Um, they live in high areas of water contamination. Um, so there's actually a perfect intersection between vulnerability to climate change, being a marginalized group, and being more susceptible uh, to COVID-19. They haven't yet published a story where they overlay their climate change data onto their uh, race-based data and onto their COVID-19 data, but they already have the data because they've been covering this story uh, for years and years. So that's an example of sort of how you can go from a simple question to a story all about um, climb, the intersection of climate change and COVID-19. Another issue, and I'm not gonna walk you through a specific story, but I want to get you brainstorming about the issue of climate change and food security. Um, again, this is a, a topic that's coming up uh, more and more in the media. And it's, again, a topic that there's lots and lots of data available. Um, there has been lots of research about food security and climate change so that we can identify whether places in the world that are getting hit hard by COVID-19 and are experiencing these lo lockdowns and interruptions to food supply chains are also the areas that were already stressed uh, by climate change. So again, Usually I start with a little bit of background research and mapping with our journalists. So we look at exposure factors. So how is agro-industrialization spread through your region? Uh, what does deforestation look like um, in your country? Um, who's vulnerable because of climate change and agro-industry? So farm workers, um, as Roxanne was mentioning, animals that are pushed out of their natural habitats. Um, and then finally, so what is the impact in the context of COVID-19? Uh, we see that the trade in wildlife is growing and that food supply chains are, are interrupted as countries stop um, sharing food among different countries and also within the same country. So again, you don't wanna do one story that tries to tackle all of food security and COVID-19. You probably, you want to start with a specific question. 
If you have ideas for questions, it would be great to see them in the chat. Um, it can be something like, mm, how is deforestation affected people's access uh, to, to rice production in my, my region? And um, who's losing access to rice? now as a result of the COVID-19 lockdowns. Um, once you find your data, um, that's when you can begin to tell more nuanced stories about uh, climate change and food supply. So where do you find data um, on climate change and food security? Uh, there's lots of different data sources that have been collecting historical data. Uh, a lot of them are international bodies that have a fairly rigorous uh, system for vetting their data. Um, I've put in several here. I think um, the ones I re rely on the most are probably the Crop Explorer because it allows us to see um, how countries are changing what they're growing. Um, the FUSE, um, the Family Early, Famine Early Warning System is really useful because it shows where food insecure um, communities are located and how the situation is changing for them. Uh, Global Forest Watch provides very detailed deforestation data. Um, again, there's, there's many, many um, international data sources that you can turn to for food security data. And then finally, looking at your own national level data to cross check um, to see if the data is consistent. Okay, so I think I'll um, wrap it up there um, and hand it back over to you um, and take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Eva. So um, if you have any questions for Eva as well as Roxanne, you can type in in the Q&A. Um, we are also interested to hear what your needs are for doing data stories in terms of uh, perhaps data sources, um, what outlets you can publish in, um, you know, what kind of training you think you, you may need, um, and we'll be very keen to hear your thoughts. You can uh, type in in the, in the chat here, or uh, you can send us an email at info.ejn at internews.org. Um, please feel free to uh, put on your thoughts here. We're not receiving any questions yet. I guess I take that as a sign of people sort of trying to digest what they've just heard. I think it's been a very rich um, sharing from Eva on the different potential data stories you can do. Um, perhaps we can talk about some other questions that we can start with Eva that um, that, that, that you think could be a, a potential for doing data stories at this point? Yep, I, yeah, I think we, are, we have one question. Yep, I think this is a really good example. Uh, what food categories have suffered the most disruption due to COVID-19? Um, and that's, that's a question that's relevant to the US, but it's also relevant to the world, right? So. In the US, we see there's been a big bottleneck um, because of meat processing. So we've had infections in meat processing plants. Um, but I, I think what we see in a lot of developing countries and we knew was true, uh, for example, in Central America, is that countries that have shifted away from growing their own food um, to agro-industrialization, and now they're only growing you know, oil palm, all of a sudden, you can't eat all oil palms. So um, if you've shifted away from growing maize and now you can't get food locally, they're depending on international imports um, to, to supply their populations with food. And I think you see a lot of troubling trends um, in countries that are more and more dependent on, on agro-industry. Um, and that's an angle that I haven't seen explored very well um, either on an international or on a, a local level. So um, I, I personally would definitely look at um, some of the data that we looked at on land use. Um, so what percentage of land is being used to cultivate um, export products and what is uh, being to, cultivated to grow locally and how is that impacting uh, food security in the region? Thank you. There's a question from Kahinda. 
um, on how we can align or relate non-COVID-19 related death data in Nigeria and climate change? Sure, so I think um, Nigeria, I did a project with BBC in Nigeria looking at fact checking around the elections and what we see is a huge issue in Nigeria is access uh, to clean water. Um, and there's a lot of wash related deaths. So things like diarrhea um, that again, you, you, it does have a COVID-19 angle because access to clean water is so important to the spread. Um, it's also important because all of those patients who would be going uh, to the hospital for non-COVID-19 related uh, diseases um, are now not going um, and often um, facing a lot of, uh, facing their, their health challenges alone at home. Um, so I think you can look at the increase of death rates for what, what is killing people in your communities and see how that's changing because uh, all these health resources are, are being taken away from things like c combating malaria. Um, I know I saw a story in, in, that in Africa specifically that there's been a disruption to the supply chain to distri distribute mosquito nets. So they've stopped distributing mosquito nets so that we should see a spike um, in things like dengue and malaria um, related to COVID-19. Question from Krishna, um, asking whether you have any suggestions for uh, data, data sources uh, on, on India, um, especially the coastal states, which are facing increased sea level rise, uh, erosion, um, salinity issues, um, and that's affecting agriculture patterns there. Whether you have any idea? Sure. So um, a lot of that crop use data you can see, uh, I know salination with rice cultivation um, was a huge issue um, in Vietnam and Myanmar. And you can actually look over time um, how rice cultivation has decreased um, and how uh, rice production um, in that region is going down. Um, and associate that with higher levels um, of malnutrition in the region. Um, and uh, basically that there's no real plan to replace um, the, for the former rice cultivation with, with other more uh, saline resistant crops um, or that they're shifting to agro ind industry that's less impacted by, um, uh, by the salinization along the coasts. Right, thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a response from Chloe um, as well saying that as an as, as NGO data investigator, she um, finds it really hard to find uh, reliable data sources. Um, there are many out there, but it's, it's, it's hard to know which are the ones that are reliable and also just to, just to find out what data resources um, are out there. Right. No, I agree. And I think um, one thing that I find surprising with journalists uh, journalists, our job basically in life is to ask questions, right? For some reason, people seem to be very, very reluctant to ask questions about data of data producers. So if you don't understand how they collected the data, if they tell you that in India, the coast, the saline levels have gone up by 15%, it's perfectly acceptable to call them and ask them how they measured that. Did they measure it in different locations over time? Are they measuring it in rice fields? Are they measuring it in ambient water? So I think the more questions you ask of the data producer, the better you begin to understand your data and your topic. Um, I wouldn't use data without understanding the issue. Um, and I think that's why it's, it's exciting to have you guys, these participants here, because you already know the issues you're interested in covering. You already have important questions you want to answer. Um, so you should be, be able to do a better job of assessing the reliability of the data that you're provided with. Thank you, Eva. And um, I've, I've got a question myself and wondering whether you, you could also share thoughts about, um, you know, COVID-19, uh, there's a lot of focus on the cases of infections, number of testing, um, but there's also a big challenge in comparing these data across different countries because of, um, you know, the, the, the way that different countries are collecting their data, the definition, um, the number of testing done. So, um, and, you know, to add on to that, looking at another layer, um, you know, say relating to climate change or food supplies, how do you deal with this, this challenge and sort of the irregular, you know, that data are, are sort of collected in a very irregular way and, and it's really difficult to compare them across the globe. Sure, and I think, um, I think something you brought up in your introduction is it's, 
the obsession with counting deaths and counting infections and counting tests is a little bit of a distraction from what are the underlying health infrastructure issues? Uh, why are our people vulnerable in the first place, right? Um, I've talked to data journalists with decades of experience, have very advanced data collection skills, and they said they wouldn't, you couldn't pay them enough money to actually build their own model to anticipate infection rates. It's very difficult. Um, and it's, I think it's a distraction from more important um, analysis we could be doing on how prepared is our healthcare system, how prepared are we for climate change, areas that there are more reliable uh, data available on. Um, I have a spreadsheet of, of about uh, 100 international data sources that we'll, uh, I'll drop into the chat too, um, so that you can go through and see if you can find um, specific data sets on, on the issues that you're looking for. Thanks, Eva. There's one question about food security. Um, this, uh, this person is interested to find out how food security will be affected after the blanket ban on wildlife trade. Um, I don't know which country um, this person is referring to, um, because in some, I think the point is that a lot of communities actually re rely on, on wild animals for cooking for a food source. And if there is a blanket ban, um, that, that will affect their food security and will also promote illegal trade. I think this is a question for both Roxanne and Eva, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Bell might actually know this uh, better, than, be able to answer this more than I can. Um, I have looked specifically into uh, communities that are dependent on, I'm sure, but I'm sure you can find data sort of on um, food security, the, the famine, the famine warning system has quite detailed data about what, what food people depend on in different regions. Um, and I think that would probably, they're probably factoring in um, lack of access to the wild animals that they would usually depend on. So, and they, they produce data updates on a weekly basis, I think. Um, so I think that would probably be the most up-to-date uh, data source that might look at that issue. But again, I can't promise that they're looking specifically at the wildlife angle. Roxanne, would you like to speak to that as well? Sure. Um, I think you made a really good point about the, the, the complete ban might also promote illegal trade. Probably, you know, unfortunately, that's, that's what seems to happen. Um, the more the traders are pushed out of the mainstream, um the kind of deeper under underground they go um and that's that's when things like the internet um can can really crop up and, and you'll find more more incidents of that happening um i i i mean i agree with eva um i think Bao could probably speak to this a lot more but i think that's a fantastic story that's a really good idea because it ties two different issues that are especially relevant um right now. And I think in terms of the type of data we have and we work with, I would just look for information um, on wild eye that pertains to food sources specifically, um, you know, as opposed to say pangolin scales or ivory, um, pangolin meat or yeah, uh, donkey skin, something like that. Um, yeah, I hope that that answers your question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think there's uh, one question from Donna there from uh, Fiji, this general lack of data for the Pacific region. Do you know any sources linked, um, data sources on, on, on relating to food security and climate change in the Pacific? Specifically in the Pacific. Um... I can't say that I've looked specifically at Pacific uh, data sources. I should, I'm from Hawaii. Uh, but um, I think I've, the, I've had really good luck just speaking with the FAO um, and asking them for any data and studies that they might have. Often they'll just publish a report, but they actually do have the data that they use to generate the report, um, but they haven't made it public because they didn't think anyone would, would be interested in it. Um, but otherwise, universities are a really good source because, again, often they'll do smaller studies, country-specific uh, studies, um, and they won't, they don't really have anywhere to publish the data. 
but if you partner with a, a university professor or other think tank or academic institution, they might have more locally relevant data than some of these bigger um, international groups do. Thank you. I think that's uh, all the time we have for today. Um, Hold on, do we have another, do we have time for another question? <laughs> I think that's okay. We can do one last question. Um, oh, actually, I think we have covered that question on, on blanket ban of wildlife. Um, oh, it's a question on preparing a, uh, a graph on global wildlife consumption. Where should I start? This is a question from Elok. You have uh, um, Roxanne, would you like to respond to this one? Alok would like to start doing um, a diagram on global wildlife consumption and any suggestion on where he, he could start? Um, I would start by looking at resources like WildEye. Um, you know, see where the trade is prevalent and that will probably direct you to um, issues around food security or animal uh, parts and products consumption. Um, but I think following something like Eva's, you know, how to guide um, could be, could be really useful and looking over her, her presentation, start, start with the data. Um, have a question. What is the specific question you'd like to answer? What do you want people to see when you look at the graph? Um, because any graph that you make, any type of visualization should be a story on its own um, without the actual story that it, that it goes with. Um, so I would start with a question, identify where you could find that type of information um, and, then, and then gather your, your data. I hope that answers your question. Good luck. <laughs> Eva, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, yeah, I think it's the same idea. Is why, are you, why do you want to tell that story? Do you have a specific question in mind? Because I think that will help you n sort of z narrow in on the data sources. So if you're concerned that in your region, a certain uh, wild, wildlife is endangered uh, because of consumption, um, that, that could be a specific question that then you find uh, national level data for. So, if you think, for example, that uh, I don't know enough about wildlife to make something up, but uh, let's say you're worried about the bat population uh, because um, people are consuming a lot of bats um, in your region, then you can say you can pose a, pose a specific question about how has bat consumption go, gone off over t over uh, gone up over time, and how has this affected the local bat population? And then you can look for uh, data specifically about that issue. Uh, but again, yeah, I think. As journalists, the biggest advantage you have is you know what stories people want to read. You know what questions they have that you could answer um, about the climate um, and you can answer with data. So uh, start with the question and start with the data and then go from there. Thank you, Eva. Um, I think Rina from, uh, Rina here in the chat is also sharing that um, there is trace um, where you can find um, data on, on supply chains of different food com commodities and uh, she's sh shared a link here in the chat. Um, yeah, I think maybe just very, very, very one final um, comment, uh, question actually from Thiel. Um, any tips for using things like FOI, freedom of information law uh, in countries where you are not based? I think, the, I think the, the tricky part is if you're not based there, can you file a freedom of information? Um, yeah. <laughs> First, you have to find, yeah, look, at some countries allow foreigners to submit FOIA requests and some do not. Um, so that's the first question. And then a lot of countries do have NGOs that will help you submit FOIA requests. Um, I think in a lot of, there's a lot of countries that have FOIA on the books, but the implementation is actually very weak. Um, and basically, the most effective strategy I've seen is put a reminder in your calendar to call them every week to follow up on your FOIA request. Uh, because a lot of FOIA requests are actually uh, completed because it's more annoying for them to talk to you every week than it is for them to go through the work of answering it. 
Um, so I think especially around sensitive issues like wildlife trafficking, um, you just kind of need to be persistent um, and make make use of the resources in country, whether it's an NGO that specializes in access to information or a group of lawyers who does pro bono work on, on submitting FOIA requests. Um, and I think uh, the Global Investigative Journalism Network has um, a set of resources too about what the FOIA procedure is in each country. Um, so do your homework first um, and then make sure, yeah, you, you follow the legislation and use the resources that are available in country. I think that's all folks. Um, thank you very much to all our three speakers today and thank you very much for your active participation and all um, the uh, very uh, interesting questions that you have sent in as well as being very um, generous in sharing your uh, resources. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our website elfjournalism.net in the next couple of days so please look up for it. Um, we will also be doing more webinars coming up and we will announce them on our website. And uh, if you would like to let us know what topics you would like us to cover in our future webinars, you can write them down now in the chat before we close it, or you can email us at info.ejn at internews.org. Um, I, I hope you leave our webinar today with some story ideas for doing data, data stories relating to COVID-19 and environmental crisis. Thank you once again, and hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.